Hello there and welcome to the sixth and final Ox Talks of the current series. Ox Talks is powered by Oxlep, the local enterprise partnership for Oxfordshire. And throughout these podcasts, we're highlighting the great work that Oxlep does and how they could potentially help your business in the future. I'm Howard Bentham and I have the pleasure of introducing you to some quite brilliant and inspirational and incredibly influential leaders in the county. All of them keen to stress the critical support that's available from Oxlep and how it could be crucial in helping your company or organisation prosper. Although we are concentrating on Oxfordshire's businesses and issues in these podcasts, you may well be listening to us elsewhere. Many of the issues we experience here will be very similar to the ones that you're potentially facing where you are. Please do share any thoughts or observations with us and join in the conversation. Head to our social media where we can pick up your comments and questions. We are at Oxfordshire LEP on Twitter and Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership on LinkedIn. It will be good to hear from you. In this edition, our focus is the changing face of the workplace, with a particular emphasis on the new four-day week working pattern that many organisations are adopting. If we take a long look back over our shoulders to the days of the Industrial Revolution, the typical Victorian mill owner had folk working six long days a week, with Sunday as a day of rest, with a chance to replenish one's soul in church. In 1922, it was the Ford Motor Company that experimented with taking the six-day week down to five, something that became permanent in 1926. Today, post-global pandemic, our working world is changing shape. The overriding mantra of those championing this new way of working is don't think about hours, think about productivity and outcome. But is a four-day week the silver bullet? Is it affordable for businesses to pay for five days and only get workers' time for four? Is it really practical for some of our major employers like the health service and industries where the lights have to be kept on 24-7? What indeed is in it for the bosses and the owners of these companies when, on the face of it, the deal heavily favours the employees? And will the four-day week actually create further inequalities in our society? Our Ox Talks guest can bring to the conversation lots of first-hand experience of the four-day week. Her company has been working this way since 2018. Indeed, sustainability is at the core of everything she is involved with, as we will discover. I am delighted to welcome to Ox Talks the founder and MD of Legacy, an award-winning sustainable events agency, Abana Fairweather. Abana, welcome. And before we get into the fascinating chat around the four day week, I really want to find out about this. Let's learn a bit more about you and your sustainability inspired career, because it's taken you on a path from the US to Fiji to Croydon and then here to Oxfordshire. Tell us more. Of course. Um, thank you for having me on the podcast. So uh, my name is Abin Fairweather and I really graduated from university all trained in physics and earth sciences, determined to go out there and do something about the planet. I'd always been really passionate about the environment through the stories and the issues that had popped up whilst I'd been in school. So without wanting to talk about the how old exactly I am, this is when environmental issues were coming to the forefront. So we were starting to hear about the hole in the ozone layer, about acid rain, about destruction of the rainforest, and that really touched me as a kid. So I really wanted to go and try and do what I could. So I was also quite passionate about space as well. And I thought, I know, I'm going to go study the atmosphere and some of the issues around satellites and weather and that kind of thing and see if maybe I can work out how to make a mark that way. So I was lucky enough to be able to get an internship in Colorado with the National Centre for Atmospheric Research as a visiting scientist, which as you can imagine as a young, I don't know, 19 or something year old then, found it fantastic. So I went off to Boulder and worked with them for a bit, learning all about the sun-earth connection. So working a bit on the upper atmosphere, on how the sun affects weathers. And it sounds very kind of a vague and far-fetched from normal life. But this kind of thing is useful for satellites, for example. So often when there's a solar storm, the satellite is affected and doesn't function. And that might knock out Wi-Fi and telecoms for 
part of a large part of the world so there are human related issues as well so I did that for a bit and thought oh maybe I could be an academic and maybe I could work in in this full time but I soon realized that being an academic space scientist whilst it sounds fantastic in theory it's a lot of looking at screens working by yourself looking at a lot of data and I felt I'm I like to talk to people. I like to be out there. So I thought this isn't really for me. So I came back home from America thinking, well, what shall I do next? And it seems amazing now, but at the time, Google really wasn't as vast as it was. So I literally typed renewable energy into Google because that felt like an area I could, I could apply myself to. And a company came up called Renewable Energy Systems Limited. Thought, great. So I just emailed them and said, just got back from America. Can I have a job, please? That's, that's basically <laughs> the email. And because things were very different back then, they said, oh, I'll come and come and have a chat and I got on very well there with their head of engineering and so I joined Renewable Energy Systems VES for five years and that was amazing because it meant I learned how to design wind farms, solar systems and all about the practicalities of, of renewable energy. So that's how I ended up from the US back in this country and then I thought I'm still really passionate about the world and the planet and what I can do and I feel I'm getting a bit niche here. I'm very focused on wind energy and whilst it's a massive part of the answer I don't feel it's the full answer I want to learn more so I decided I'm going to take myself off traveling to see what everyone else is doing to see if they've got any answers so again back in the days when the internet was much less fast and you were able to do this I think I put into Google renewable energy in the Caribbean and Fiji because I thought well if I'm going to learn about this I might as well go off somewhere nice to do it <laughs> and an engineering company in Fiji got back to me and said, oh, actually, we, we could do with some help. So I went off to Fiji to work with an engineering company. And that was the complete opposite to Res, where um, Res was an engineering consultancy and much more corporate, whereas Fiji, it, it was basically one man who set up a an engineering firm in Fiji to go and install renewables. But for me, it was great. It gave me really hands-on experience as opposed to talking about the theory. And that's, I think I've taken through in my career, trying to get hands-on experience as well as matching that to, to the theory. So worked in Fiji for a bit, came back, thought, okay, I'm going to take my renewable energy knowledge that I've learned about now. And I feel I can advise people on this now. So worked as a consultant in renewable energy and also sustainability as an extension for that from that for many years. And then thought, I still don't feel like I'm making a difference here. I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking and nothing really is happening. And I could see because as part of my role, which had again become much more corporate, I had to organise lots of events and I really loved it. And it was quite a dichotomy for me because I was doing a very, very important job advising very important people, governments and ministers and very big companies on sustainability and renewables. But the bit I loved was the event organising, the organising of conferences and that kind of thing, which wasn't part of my job. It's just something I happen to do. And I thought, well, maybe I can, maybe this is it. Maybe the events industry needs some of the knowledge that I have. So I decided to set up legacy back in 2016. I was living in Croydon at the time, which is where I grew up. And it's all snowballed from there. So legacy is a sustainable events company. I try and advise the events industry on how to be more sustainable. And that uh, people always say, well, that that's a crazy endpoints from starting as a space scientist, yeah, as an atmospheric yeah. scientist. But for me, it doesn't feel like that because a lot of the issues are still applicable. So when you're talking about festivals, for example, empowering festivals, my renewables knowledge is really applicable there. And when you're talking about the built environment and energy use and carbon emissions and waste, the experience I've had working in sustainability is also very relevant. So to me, it doesn't feel a complete change of direction. It feels a natural extension from where I started, which is really about understanding as much as I can about how to solve some of these environmental issues and then applying them in the best way that I can. We're talking obviously about the, the changing face of, of the workplace. From your 20 plus year working experience up until the pandemic, would I be right in assuming that obviously things have changed technology wise, but really that it hasn't been a, a great world of change over those two decades? I think there has been a world of change, but it feels like the world has caught up to what a lot of people were doing anyway in various industries. I think some of the buzzwords around today, around flexible working, hybrid working, video calling, all of these terms perhaps didn't exist in the same way, but a lot of multinational companies or smaller companies have been doing this already just without calling it those names. So to me, it feels like the rest of the world has caught up. And so it feels like a big change. 
but actually it's just a natural progression of what's been of the changes what's been happening gradually over 20 years so the pandemic in your mind then is not the the great red line that's where things have have changed since the pandemic it, it's just a, a it's bit just of a catch-up game more mainstream exactly right. exactly interesting because as you've touched on there there are many variations hybrid flexible working how important is flexibility for businesses to survive in the current climate? And and are these variations sort of working for everyone? Again, it's not a new thing. Flexible working has been enshrined in UK law for a long, long time. So this shouldn't be a new topic for any business. But perhaps now they're starting to grapple with what that actually means for a large proportion of their workforce. And so... I, th- I think it is difficult, but it feels inevitable to me. It's be- and the pandemic has accelerated that. Flexible working seems a natural way of responding to the modern world, which is now 24 hour. The workforce is made up of different types of people. And we've, we've seen all those kind of demographic changes coming through. And so it, it, it is a difficult conversation, I think, for businesses to have, but it's inevitable that, that, it, that it's had. And it really should have started, that conversation should have been happening for the last 10 years really maybe because they haven't been happening the if you like the implications for businesses are a little more stark Uh, technology for uh, and the expense around that perhaps perhaps and and just general costs of how these things are are going to be managed uh, are conversations that need to be had should we say by the management but uh, might not have been happening in the past absolutely and i feel this touches on lots of issues pertinent to the workforce, for example, perhaps the people making the decisions in businesses now are of a different generation to the people coming into the business who think completely differently. And so those conversations were going to happen as the workforce age changed anyway. And so it might feel like a significant investment now. As I said, it feels inevitable. The workplace will change, has always changed as the new generation comes in. And so it's about being aware of that and planning for that. Tell us a bit about Legacy then and how you operate as a business. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, Legacy has been operating a four day working week pretty much right, from you, when you started, wasn't it? That's right. So it was part of me trying to understand about trying to solve some of the world's issues, and that includes social issues. It felt very hypocritical for me to talk about sustainability and the need to reduce carbon emissions and a lot of that without really understanding what a work life balance really meant for well being purposes, for example. And so I wanted Legacy from the start to really try and live those values and have a true work-life balance, which it seems obvious to me that means a week that's more balanced in terms of how much time you spend at work and how much time you spend at your leisure. A lot of people listening to to this podcast will, will go, okay then, I mean, are there some basic rules, generic rules around a four-day week? I, I get that you work four days, but is it full pay? That for your four four days, the the hours that you work, I mean, the days off that you have, how, how does it work? So there are lots of different ways that you can implement a four day week. Um, there are some rules though that all the studies really show that in order to get the benefits you need to apply. So the first, and this is probably the most, I suppose, controversial, is that to work a full day week, the idea is that you give your employees a hundred percent of their pay for working reduced hours. So it's not that you reduce their their salaries by an amount commensurate with the four days. It's that you give them the same salary but require them to work less hours. So it's not about condensing a week into four longer days. Um, so that, I think, would be the fundamental rule of a four-day week. After that, it really depends on what your company goals are um, and who your audience is so for example at legacy we're a sustainable events company so we try and organize events considering the environment and social issues in their design and for us monday tends to be a quieter day in terms of organizing events so we all do not work on mondays for us it's just an extension of the weekend and we all at legacy work tuesday to to friday Um, but if you're in a different type of business it might be that each employee chooses the day of the week that they do for therefore they take off during the week or it might be another model I've seen is to on each of the five days a week to work a shorter day so to make up your your day off by working two hours less perhaps a day so there are different ways that it can be applied it depends on the industry that you're in and and talking sort of more Generally, again, here, we'll focus in on, on your business in a bit. What's in it for the employee? We get the, the, the perk, if you like, of the same money for fewer hours. What else is in it for, for those that work for the company? I feel that there's quite 
a lot of benefits for the employee. And they range from apparently quite trivial to quite fundamental. So one is that at the moment, I think a lot of people find it quite difficult to organise doctor's appointments, lots of um, life admin, I suppose, tasks because everything is closed um, on a weekend. And so it gives people a day of the week to be able to organise that kind of thing. And that means they don't have to do it in in the rest of their working week. So I suppose that's a benefit for both the employee and the employer, that all of that stuff is contained within within one day. Um, Another huge benefit is just the time to be able to focus on other things outside the workplace as well as manage your family or caring obligations. So a lot of people I speak to who do a four day week, they use that day to go and visit museums or to volunteer or just to spend some time walking around or just reading or relaxing. So it gives you another day that can be just your day to really just catch up on what you like to do. And linked to that are the benefits for reducing burnout as well, for just greater well-being, for greater potential for being in nature, all of those things which are very good for productivity so they benefit the business are also very good for for the employee. Okay, we, that's a, a good sell for, for the employee. Perhaps a tougher sell is what's in it for the employer because the deal seems stacked against the bosses on the face of it. It does, but in, to answer that question, I'm not quite sure what would convince the employer if the data already does not convince. All the studies show that a full day week is beneficial for an employer because it results in greater productivity, fewer sick days, less burnout, less stress, better relationships between the employer and the employee. And that's good, good for for business. All the studies show that regardless of whether they've been done in this country or the other studies that have been done in Iceland, in, in Belgium. So... I think fundamentally, it just seems to make good business sense. If that's what all the data is showing you, then it seems a no-brainer to me to to not do this. I think the, the big hurdle is changing over, and that's what the recent study showed that ran from June to December last year. There is obviously going to be some investment needed to change over to a four-day week, just in terms of communicating that and thinking about the risks for your business. But once it's happened very few businesses seem to go back to the old model because they can see it works for them. What about the affordability of it? I'm thinking for, for the, the the employer here, five days pay for four days work. From the studies, uh, I've read a number that you've referenced there, productivity would need to rise by 15% to pay for it. So I, you're, you're asking people to work harder than in those four days... Um, no, I mean, again, referring back to the studies and I'm referring again to my experience in the workplace, I'm pretty sure there's 15% of um, work time fat to be to be trimmed in a lot of people's working days, just because a lot of the time people are burned out. So they take that time back during the working week. So it's a well known stat that in this country, we are probably not the most productive We're not. in terms of so all the four day week is doing is just increasing that productivity time whilst giving the employee benefit. What about increasing inequalities in our society? They, they've tried this for about the last 20 years or so in France, and it, it's shown that the, the lowest paid have end, ended up with lower pay because of it. So it, it's, if you like, exacerbated the inequalities in society. That's often cited as a reason why this is a bad idea. I, I thought there's there's many, many studies that show that flexible working actually is better for addressing inequalities. But in this particular case, I think that's why the fundamental point about a four day week is it has to be 100 percent of pay for 80 percent of the time. If you reduce the pay as well, then obviously that will lead to the inequalities that you've been talking about as employees try and gain that salary that they feel they've lost. And so that's why that is such a fundamental rule of implementing a successful four day week. Mm. But but do you take the point that it it could, if it's not done properly, exacerbate an inequality? And and obviously that's not what we're trying to achieve here in, a, in an already unequal yeah. society. I don't feel, I can't see how it would personally, and none of the data shows that it would exacerbate, exacerbate an inequality. As I said, flexible working is seen as something that massively addresses some of the issues around inequality. And like I said, if you do it the way as advised by the four day week organisation, so you do not reduce your team's pay, then I can't see how that would then lead to the inequalities that you're talking about purely because of the four-day week. Obviously, if you're in a business where you've got other issues that 
you're addressing around zero hour contracts and that kind of thing, that might be something to work on in terms of inequality. But I can't personally see how a four day week would exacerbate those issues. That's really interesting. One, one question I really want to ask from a very personal point of view is that you're an events company. I work in events as well. And some of the days in events are Victorian mill length, 17, 18 hour days. It's crazy sometimes, but you have to do it. That's an event. So how does that square in the, the, the four day world you, you inhabit? Yeah, of course. And I, I get that a lot. And my answer is that to me and to my team, a Monday is just like a weekend. So as you say, there are some times in the lead up to an event where we are all working all hours to get that event done. And as you know, if you do work in events, your deadline is your deadline. There's no there's no missing it because the show must go on. And so my team is used to working long hours in the run-up to the event, as am I, that, that standard for an events company. However, in the same way as if I ask my team to work on Sundays or Saturdays, they can then claim time back if they work on a Monday. So it's exactly the same as, to me, as working on a, on a weekend day or out of hours in any other context. So how does your team operate now then? Are they expected to be in the office? Do they work from home around this flexibility? It's, it's really fascinating, this insight into, into your world. Because again, there'll be a lot of uh, managers and uh, um, employers listening thinking, well, how can we make that work for us? Because this does sound like a great idea, but will it work for me? Setting up legacy carbon emissions was top of mind in terms of what are some of these societal issues I really want to address, especially in the events world? And so travelling is a massive issue there. So we've also been a remote first company since the beginning. So we do have an office in Oxford, but my team are remote all over the place. And that's worked for us since the beginning and continues to do so. So for us, the pandemic obviously was difficult as it was for everyone in the events industry, but we were already used to working remotely. We had a full day week and also because of our sustainability goals. We've been talking to clients about virtual events and running some events virtually for years, absolutely years. And so when the pandemic happened, it wasn't such a huge shift for us. We switched quite quickly into running virtual events all the time because we saw it as a necessary part of any event strategy and any company that wants to be more more sustainable. And in a creative company like yours, I, I, I'm assuming then Legacy doesn't have a water cooler because you won't have any water cooler moments uh, if you're doing this. How do you be creative when you don't see people face to face. So we do meet sometimes. We do get to, I think it's very important to get together face to face. So we do we do meet face to face. We obviously we often we obviously work on events together and we just create those water cooler moments online as well. So we use online calls, we have lots of um team chats, we use Slack as a com source, we use that quite a lot to stay in touch. So we use the the standard set of tools to try and try and stay in touch. But again, this is not something new to any company that's multinational will have been working on some of these issues for, for 20 years. This won't be new to them. So it just feels like the world has finally woken up to the fact that this is a new way of working. Yeah. I'm I'm just sort of trying to think like a like a boss hearing this for the for the first time, think, well, okay, yeah, I, I can see how this <laughs> might work. So do you think Flexible working then is reliant on building trust with your employees because uh, you've sort of touched on this. What, what's to stop me on my f- day off going to, I don't know, work at the local factory or whatever I want to do? And that sort of defeats the object of my day of rest. I think successful working is important and is reliant on building trust. And I think successful companies are those that, that have the trust and manage their their teams appropriately. And so if you have the kind of employees who you don't trust to focus on your work specifically, then then that's that's a, a management issue. Or if you already have company policies in place to restrict your staff working elsewhere, if that's appropriate for you, then again, that, that shouldn't a full day week isn't really contingent on that. But as I said, flexible working has been enshrined in UK legislation at least for, for a long, long time. And so if companies don't trust those who have applied for flexible working for whatever issues in the past, then th- this, this isn't a, a, a new, <laughs> this isn't new that, in that, that sense. That leads it nicely in, into about staff retention, productivity, happiness. I mean, w- talk about some of these tangible successes that you've seen from this way of working? It's it's quite difficult for me to answer that question because legacy has always worked a four-day week. So from a legacy point of view, it's difficult for me to give you stats on it was this way before and now it's this way after. But I can say that 
I have a very engaged team. I have no issues with retaining staff at all. I suppose my, my issues might be that I find it quite difficult to get my staff to take longer leave because they don't feel burned out. They don't feel they need to take two or three weeks at a time. So I actually have to manage them to take to take longer longer holidays That's really actually. Interesting. Yeah. So that that I suppose could be seen a, a, as a downside. Um we seem att- attractive as as an employer, I think like many people in the events industry, at the moment we are struggling to recruit, but I think that those are issues linked to the pandemic as opposed to, I think lots of companies are, are struggling with that. Um, I can't, I'd love to be able to give you stats on saying we implemented a full day week and my business is now 16% more successful, but I can't because I don't have a before situation to compare to. But we seem to be successful, viable, we have a range of clients, so as far as I can see it, there would be no reason to change it. I can't see any downsides that would lead me to say a four day week at Legacy is not working. Therefore, let's go to a five day week. That would seem to be massively harmful. More, I mean, you talk about the, your staff not wanting to take their leave because they love you so much that they, <laughs> they, obviously it, want, to, they want to be at work with you. Uh, but more generally, then, any other negatives that, that have been thrown up in this cards on the table? I genuinely can't think of any. I, I, I really did rack, rack my brain. So one is definitely our, my staff don't seem as willing to take longer periods of leave. And I think it's important that they do, especially in the events world as well. I think it's managed when they do. I don't want them all taking leave at the time of, well, Christmas actually is the classic one. Everyone yeah, gets to course. Christmas, yeah. they haven't taken their leave and then everyone wants to take all their leave at Christmas because as a legacy, we... I want staff to take their leave, so I don't really want them to carry it over to the next year. So I suppose that might be a downside, managing staff leave. Um, I really, really am struggling to to think of any others. I suppose sometimes in the events world, it feels like the week is too short, that you can't get as much done in a week, in a week. But that's, I think, just a factor of working in events when a deadline's approaching and it doesn't feel like there's enough hours in the day. So I don't think that's unique to a full day week. So honestly, I've racked my brains. I genuinely cannot think of any downsides to to doing one once you already do one a study that uh, i've read recently um because a, a lot of the studies you see around really do highlight the merits of of this new way of working but perhaps we're not hearing both sides of the story uh, this research i saw was from a leading recruitment firm of about three thousand employees they they said that just some of the headlines from it overall working hours only reduced by about four hours uh, just over a quarter said either working they were working more hours or had no change to their five day a week about a fifth reported an increase in burnout and interestingly nearly three quarters would give up work socials to have the chance of working a four day week means that they would be happy to give up that that work culture don't know your, your thoughts on that so again that study i would really need to understand if they did a true four day week did they give their staff 100 percent of their pay or did they reduce their salary accordingly so i feel it's not comparable unless we know that but to answer the point about some employees still working the five days again i think that that's a management issue as, as i've already to, alluded to in working in events Having a full day week policy, it's not magical. Some staff will still work overtime. They will still work extra hours. There are still pressures in the workforce, difficult clients, pressure to overwork. All of that still still applies. It's just that as a business, your standard operating procedure is to work four days instead of five. So if your company is having those issues, they're not going to magically go away just by implementing a four day week. They still need to be managed. And uh, again, employers like the NHS, for example, uh, would a four-day week model work for them, especially in the, the current climate, uh, or industries where the lights have to be kept on 24-7? Well, industries where the lights have to be kept on 24-7 are already used to shift working. So for them, it should be a natural natural transition to just having shorter shifts or however that might work. But I believe there are some public sector organisations who've already embraced a four-day week. I seem to remember reading about a council quite close to here who, for their um, refuge collection staff, have implemented a four-day week. And to me, that seems the ultimate test because obviously there are specific days when that activity takes place. So if that organisation can do it successfully, I can't really think of any use cases why any other organisation might not because, as, as I've said... A flexible working environment has been enshrined in law for a long, long time. So companies should already be used to having staff that work 
different numbers of hours in the week. So it's just about doing that at a larger scale. It shouldn't be a completely new process to think through for any organisation. That's really interesting, Abana. Thank you for the, for the moment. Let's bring into the conversation Oxlep's Corporate Operations and Compliance Manager, Sadie Patamia. Uh, Sadie, you've... You're the sort of brains behind getting this four-day week trial. I should stress it's a, a trial at Oxlep. Uh, tell us how that's going, because it's only been in place for a couple of months. Or that's so. right. So we started um, in April on our uh, four-day week trial, <clears throat> and we are operating a, as um, Avon pointed out, 180-100 model. So we're working from Mondays to Thursdays. So Oxlep is closed on a Friday. And we are having 100% of the productivity, 80% of the time for 100% of the wages. Um, And the way we've sort of made sure we have 100% productivity is, you know, again, to echo what Abena said earlier, is by trimming that work fat. So we're looking at the way that meetings take place. Can they be shorter? Um, The amount of time people spend answering emails and all that sort of thing. So there is, you know, work to be you know, trimmed out of a day. So that's how we're working at the moment. So we're working 30 hours a week for our full-time staff and our part-time staff have obviously had their um, hours reduced as well, by and large, by about the 20%. And and what are the sort of key objectives then? Are, are you setting out to achieve what? So what we want to achieve is to increase the well-being of our staff, um, to improve their work-life balance. We want them to come back to work on a Monday feeling rejuvenated and rested, relaxed and ready to go again. And you're working with Four Day Global, That's uh, Four right. Day Week Global, I should say, on, on the project. Worth just explaining who they are and, and what they do. So Four Day Week Global are a, as the name suggests, a global um, not-for-profit. And um, what they are doing is they are helping businesses all around the world uh, get on board this, you know, Four Day Week movement to actually, you know, change the way work works globally. They are organising trials all over the world. Um, I think they're just starting one in Australia. Um, but they are they're doing that. They all over the world type trials and they provide mentoring. There are platforms that will help you with training your staff um, on how to, you know, be as productive and they supply mentors. There are you know forums and all that sort of thing. So you can sort of have discussions with other people. So it's like a support system. And what about you personally? How are you you finding it? Uh, how's it changed your world? How's, how's your admin? I love how you describe that. Your admin day for your your life. It's great. I mean, <laughs> it's really good because um, it's given me the opportunity to do some volunteering as a trustee with a local charity. So I'm doing that sometimes on a Friday, which is really great. Helps me feel like I'm giving back. And also at the moment, it's helping me support my uh, teenage daughter as she uh, navigates the world of um, university applications. So, but, you know, that's really useful because it means we can go to the university open days, which are often on a Friday, without me actually having to use my annual leave to do that. And and how does this change in the way of working align with or indeed impact upon the recruitment process at all. It'll help us become an employer of choice. Um, we know that the job market is really difficult at the moment and it's difficult to attract talent. Um, and what we hope is that by doing this sort of thing, we work flexibly as well. We're a 100% remote business and we're hoping it'll help us stand out when you have the opportunity to work flexibly and potentially to be doing four days a week. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, the conversation around recruitment and retention is is a really interesting one when you factor in the, the four-day week. I mean, for businesses, I guess, looking to try and stay relevant in terms of workplace changes, what would your advice be here? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a huge question. But I suppose for me, it would be to really try and embrace the new ways of working based on the evidence that's available to do that. So as I said, there are many studies that show that a full day week is better for business productivity. For example, there are many studies that show that having a diverse workforce is better for for business. For example, there are many studies that show that considering sustainability right through your business practices are better for your workforce. So even though it might seem a difficult decision to have, especially at the moment with the cost of living crisis, to make those kind of investment decisions, all the evidence shows that it will it will pay off. So that's that's what I suppose. Be brave and consider the studies that that are available. And perhaps the second tip might be 
this doesn't all need to be implemented in, in one chunk. I think it's just about being strategic about how you might do that and the order you might you might work on things. So we've talked today about being remote first. We've talked about being a four day week and flexible working. That all, doesn't all have to happen in, in one go. You can be managed and strategic about how, how that's done. Is the four day week symptomatic to the workplace now? It is a buyer's market for job hunters. So I see it's a four-day week advertising. I'll have a bit of that perhaps going on. Absolutely. I can't see how it wouldn't benefit your recruitment process. It would definitely be seen as a perk. And it would definitely be seen as a perk, I think, for the younger generation as well, who are much more interested in working for companies that fit fit with their values and also allow them to perhaps expand on their interests or be more purposeful in their lives. So it's definitely a recruitment benefit. What, would you back that up? I, I agree entirely. We talk about it being a perk uh, at the moment it's a perk but in the future uh, it would be great if it was just the norm but the other thing to remember in all of this that we haven't mentioned is that we're all working for longer in our lives you know um the, gone are the days where when we retired at 60 or 65 you know goodness knows how long you know people are in their 20s are going to have to work to so to be able to do it for four days a week that's is, a very good point actually i mean what factors uh, are potential employees seeking when it comes to looking for a new job you, you, you talked about how difficult it is to find the right people I in the world of events what are they asking for um they're asking for flexible working absolutely and remote working as well so to be able to work from different locations and um, apart from from an office um, they're asking for an office often for the younger generations they do want an office and they want they want an attractive working environment and that i think is a difficult thing to manage if you have a large proportion of your staff who want to work remotely. How do you then create the kind of vibrant office that especially the younger generation want to work in? So they're, they're, they're asking for that. They're not so much asking for what you see in lots of articles about businesses. So they're not really asking for um, free dry cleaning or ping pong tables or any of that kind of thing. I've, I've not seen that. So, so it's a ping pong free zone. At, at we are a, a ping pong okay. free zone at the okay. moment. Okay. But they, those kind of perks <laughs> don't seem to be really significant to to, to that. Um, pay obviously is, is, you know, an important factor with recruiting as well. But I'd say pay, working for a business that has some kind of values or speaks the same kind of language that share the values of the person and flexible working, I think, are the main the main three. And what are you seeing at Oxford, Sadie? I agree. I think it's, you know, employers need to show and prove that they genuinely care about their staff in terms of their mental health and their well-being. Having a poster up in the break room isn't enough. You know, you need to actually, you know, walk the walk and show that you care about mental health and well-being. And a four-day week and flexible working, they're living proof that we are invested in you as our staff. We're empowering you. We trust you. We're here for you. Sadie and Abana, thank you both for the moment, we'll chat again shortly. It's good to have you along for Ox Talks, the brand new podcast series powered by the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. If you want to get in touch with the team at Oxlep to comment on what you've been hearing, find us on social media. We're on Twitter at Oxfordshire Lep or via LinkedIn. Search for Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Perhaps you run a company or organisation that's looking for some specific help or simply need a steer to the most appropriate business advice available. Why not try the Oxlep Business Support Tool? Oxlep's Business Support Tool is here to help your company. Whether you're just starting out, growing or ready to take on a new business challenge. If you're looking for the latest advice and support, complete our business support tool today and get set to receive a bespoke action plan for your organisation. Head to OxfordshireLEP.com to find out more. Let's chat more to Abana Fairweather. This is so, so interesting getting in, inside your head. And we talked right at the start of this podcast about uh, your sustainability goals. Let's focus on three words that have become so important to, to businesses of late, environmental, social and governance. Why has ESG become such a thing, the gospel of ESG? Yeah, it feels a little bit like sustainability has been rebranded, but I feel like ESG is something slightly different to sustainability. So ESG, I suppose, environmental social governments, to me is about responding as a business to those those issues. So it's almost a risk management issues. If you're a company that 
is very concerned about your supply chain, for example, how might weather changes in Asia affect your business? That to me is a core ESG type type issue. Whereas sustainability is really more about how can your business contribute towards resolving some of those environmental and social issues. So it's more outward facing. So I suppose for me, the difference is that ESG is looking at the world, how it affects you. So more inward looking and sustainability is about how you, your place in the world in your business affects, affects the world. But I agree that um, it's huge at the moment. I think ESG, because it is so closely linked to risk management, really originated in the financial sector. And that is why at the moment it is huge because the financial sector is facing all kinds of challenges. I probably don't need to go into what those are. And so that that's why ESG combined with climate change and some of those other issues does seem so, so important. What would your advice for businesses looking to integrate ESG policies be and, and where is a good place to start? I feel like a business can't really avoid looking at ESG now. Um, it stands for environmental and social governments, especially if you're a larger business and you are buffeted by what is happening in the world supply chains. You cannot afford to just ignore what is happening environmentally, especially as climate change now is visibly having an impact on the weather systems of various um, parts of the world. And so you, you can't ignore that. And socially as well, I think we've seen all kinds of um, uh issues come to the forefront in the last five years socially as well and that that can have a massive impact on your business um governance again um we've um there's been <laughs> i think a lot of companies have fallen foul of perhaps not having um stringent governance so it, it's to me ESG is just about managing risks outside of say legal and commercial commercial risks all those other risks which impact on your business and so you can't afford as a business to just ignore those but could they be viewed as a distraction? I mean, away from what you do as a business and seen as, a, I guess, a, another layer of admin that you've got to deal with and it's stopping us being a profitable company. I'm sure you could see risk management as a distraction and you could see legal issues as a distraction as well and all governance issues as a distraction. But I think they're fairly fundamental to, to successful business working. And again, the studies show that Considering some of these lead to better business, they lead to more productive businesses, to more successful businesses. So if you really want to stand out and to really transform your business for this next phase of work that we're in, it really is not something that you can afford to ignore. I, I agree entirely. Um, I was actually at a conference quite recently that uh, took in a lot of um, ESG topics. And the other thing, you can bring it back around to your employees. Um, statistics show that at a certain age group, so, you know, say the sort of 20s to 30s, won't even consider working for a company that doesn't have strong ESG policies and governance in place. If you're setting sustainability goals, if this is something as a business you're looking to do, how... How would you do that? And, and what's a good way of measuring them? Two fantastic questions. So speaking from the point of view of legacy as a sustainable events company, we have nine themes that we adhere to with all our event design processes. And they cover issues such as transport and travel, energy and carbon emissions, waste, water, social issues. So we try and embed those nine themes in everything that we're doing. And that keeps us structured in terms of what we're doing and allows us to set targets. In terms of measurement, we are not perfect by any means. And that's because it's often really difficult to measure some of these issues. For example, if you're running an event and you feel you've done a lot in terms of making that event uh, more positive in terms of social change, how, how do you capture that in metrics? It's, it's really difficult and I don't have the answer to that. But we, we try and we try and use other, uh, date, other companies and data out there to try and measure that. But I think first would be trying to set some kind of strategy or goals around what sustainability means to you as a business. And that might vary from being supply chain focus to environmentally focus to governance focus whatever that means for your business and then starting from there and then thinking perhaps longer term and working back to if you've set goals for 2040 for example or 2030 as a business what does that mean for your actions in the in the here and now Sadie um You've got a couple of questions from our social channels. What are, what are people asking? So we're being asked, uh, do employers uh, working a four-day week ever put restrictions on what staff can do on this extra day off, which we touched on earlier? Um, certainly at Oxlab, we, we don't. It's an extension of the weekend and, you know, we have 
I say we have no interest in what people are doing. That's not true. We're very <laughs> interested in what people are doing because it's exciting. You know, we're hearing all sorts of tales of horse riding, volunteering and all that sort of thing. But I'm, I think that most companies shouldn't do that because, you know, it is a day off. It is not um, an extension of the work and all that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, it's important to actually respect people's time. So... But equally, it, it is my time. I and mean, if I fancy going working freelance for somebody, should I be able to? I think that depends on your individual company policies. If you allow staff to have a Saturday job, for example, then the same might apply if you go to a four day week. If your uh, employee, if you don't allow your employee, employees to take on other work, then the same applies. It shouldn't be any different for a four day week. So you, you put no restrictions on yours at all? Um, at Legacy, we don't put any restrictions at all on the same way I don't restrict what people can do on their weekend. I don't put any restrictions on what people can do on their on their Monday, which is the day that we have off in the week. And I, I, I agree with Sadie in that I think employers should be careful about encroaching on that time because that relationship of trust we talked about earlier was that I will be more productive in my work hours in return for that time off. That's what the 180, 100 model is the, the final hundred of that is that it's a kind of um, a statement, a pledge to be more productive. And so to respect that that bargain, the employee does need to be hands off on the time that they've given back. That's really interesting. Uh, what else have you got for us? We've uh, been asked how the four day working week affects employees mental well-being and does the model contribute to increased social isolation where colleagues have less time to connect with each other? Um so I can speak from Oxlep's point of view. Um, we've undertaken quite a lot of training before embarking on our four day week to help people understand productivity and a lot about themselves. And the thing that we've always made it really clear is those chats, those conversations are still really important. Yes, we're trying to make meetings more efficient, but not at the expense of what did you do at the weekend then? type conversations. Um, we also have an employee-led social committee at Oxlap. So it's the employees making decisions about when is the right time to do something social, what should it be, and how can this work for the majority of staff. Um, as a remote business, it's really important to us to maintain those relationships with each other. I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. That social isolation thing is is really important though isn't it because you can still feel isolated even in a busy room on a busy zoom call how do you deal with that it's a really good question and i don't think that we've dealt with it really satisfactorily actually because i feel that there's a it's a completely valid point that especially the younger generations are perhaps missing out on some of that social activity that old people like me just mm -hmm. took for granted when I when I entered the workforce. So at Legacy, we have various weeks that we organise. So we have a wellbeing week, for example, that we all take part on. That's really good fun. So we try really hard to just have social activities as part of what we do. Another example might be that if we're all working on an event, we'll reserve a day perhaps after the event to get together as a team socially but it's a it's a really valid question I don't think it's necessarily a question about the four-day week as such I feel it's a question about the changing nature of work mm. and online versus offline and how connected we all are and AI and all of those other issues so I don't know the answer but I don't think it's specifically about a four-day week I, no. I would agree with that and the other thing sort of to bear in mind with this new way of working is that one has to be much more intentional um, when you say to somebody on a Zoom call or if you are in an office or at a meeting, how are you? It's the classic, actually, you know, ask again yeah. because everybody is programmed to go and find thanks without thinking about it. And working remotely, it, it's really important to be really intentional about your interactions and make sure you're, you know, really paying attention. Somebody that's always had their camera on on that team Zoom call, why is their camera off? And, you know, it's worth having a, you know, maybe just keeping an eye on that sort of thing. It really helps. I think so. And also just having the space for non-work related chat, I suppose the unproductive parts of the day where yeah. some of that is important for, for business. So, and it's often difficult to do that on a, on a Zoom call to ask what somebody watched on TV the night before or whatever it might be. So just making space for non-work time really. Yeah. I think is and important. that, especially in the world of events, the, the decompression factor is really important, isn't it? Just to, you do need to come down from <laughs> from the, the highs on that. Uh, Abada, some some final thoughts from you, if if we can. What would be your top three tips for businesses looking to implement a four day working week 
based on your experience? My experience is that we've always worked a four day working week. So it's, it's a, for me, I, I'm advising businesses who might be transitioning from an existing work uh, setting to, to this new way of working. So I appreciate that it's it's a really difficult concept for lots of businesses to grasp that this could work, that they reduce their working day, but still somehow become more successful as a business. It doesn't seem intuitive. I appreciate that. So I think my first tip would be to do the research. There's lots of research out there. There are lots of studies on this. So you don't have to trust what people say. You can go into the numbers yourself and, and look at that. So do the research. And that's also helpful because if you do decide this is something you want to try and you need to explain it to people, you're going to get all kinds of questions about it. And it's good to be armed in in advance with answers to that. So do the research, understand the data. The second tip probably would be if you're considering it, um, the reason it works is because you really need to adopt the fundamental kind of principles of a four day week. So as said, you know, I've been saying the 100, 80, 100 model. If you try and adopt parts of that, you're probably not going to get the success that the studies have have shown. So to try and be wholehearted about this and strategically can embrace the entire concept, not, not just the parts of it you think might work for your business. And again, I accept it feels like a, a huge thing to implement for any business. So to do, to do a trial, summer actually is a great time to do a trial because I think a lot of staff really like um, shorter Fridays, for example, to take advantage of the longer longer daylight hours. So do, do a short trial to see what happens. And then if that works, that then perhaps makes it easier to transition into a fully working four-day week model. Huge thanks to Abana Fairweather and a big thank you also to Sadie Patamia from Oxlep as well. And thank you for listening to Ox Talks. As I mentioned right at the start, this is the final edition in the first series and we hope you'll tune into more when we're back later in the year. Please spread the word, tell your friends or colleagues about us and if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions on our social channels. It's always good to hear from you. Remember, business support in Oxfordshire is just an email or a phone call away. The Oxlet Business Support Tool can signpost you to expert help in just a matter of minutes. It's definitely worth taking a look. Find it on our website, oxfordshirelep.com. And if you didn't catch any of the first five editions of Ox Talks, do find time to listen to the CEO at Blenheim Palace, Dominic Hare, on the vital role of the visitor economy. Chaz Bouncher from Oxford University with his vision to retain world-class talent here in Oxfordshire. And Emma Gibson on the importance of SMEs. The whole series is available from where you normally get your podcasts and all episodes are definitely well worth a listen. But for now, from the whole Oxlep team and from me, Howard Bentham, it's goodbye.